Hi everybody, um, it's 11 o'clock now, so we'll start this session and to everybody who's joined us already. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar session where we're going to be discussing the question. What are the challenges in effective implementation of safety initiatives for the helicopter community? Um, my name is John Franklin. I'm head of safety promotion at EASA. Uh, and this is the first of what will hopefully be a, a, a number of uh, webinars and online events done as a collaboration between EASA and our Together for Safety initiative, uh, the European Helicopter Association, and also with Heli Offshore. Uh, and I'm pleased to say we, we have what I like to think is a bit of a dream team here as a, uh, as a, as a group of people for our first discussion. Um, so we've got uh, representatives from the three organisations and, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. So uh, first of all, David Solar from uh, EASA, can you start and introduce yourself to our audience, please? Sure, John. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Hopefully uh, uh, you're in good shape and safe. I'm David Solar. I'm the head of the uh, uh, General Aviation and VTOL Department in the Certification Directorate. Um, maybe to make it short, it's uh, being responsible for the certification and continuousness of uh, all flying uh, aircraft except the, the big birds, so from the business jets to, uh, to the light UIS. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for that, David, and uh, it's great to have you join us. And uh, next, Thierry, maybe you could introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, with pleasure. Hi, everybody. I'm Thierry Couder. I am from France. I am uh, the executive director of the French Helicopter Association and uh, uh, the vice chairman of uh, the European Helicopter Association. Uh, in my background, I had uh, been an uh, uh, expert in human factors and uh, uh, sociological uh, problems with the air safety uh, in the French Navy Fleet Air Arm. Fantastic, thank you. It's great to have you with us. And, and finally, we're joined by Tim Rolf from uh, Heli Offshore. Tim, can you introduce yourself to uh, our audience, please? Good morning, John. Thank you and good day to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Tim Rolf. I'm the CEO of Heli Offshore. Uh, I joined Heli Offshore and the rest of the team there in July last year. And prior to that, I'd had 30 years uh, working with Bristow helicopters uh, in a number of operational training and safety roles. Fantastic, and uh, it, it's great to have you know, such a, a great panel of, of experts to discuss. Hopefully, we've got we're, we're over 130 people now. Um, I just before we kind of really get into the discussion, I'd just like to kind of do a few bits of housekeeping, particularly for the audience. So, um, because of the challenges we always have with these WebEx, with some people muted and some people not, actually the system set up so all of all of the audience members, uh, you're all automatically muted. Um, if you what we would love particularly uh, is for you to ask questions during the session and particularly as we get to the later part of the session where we're talking about the challenges of really turning all of the different recommendations and, and what we're talking about in terms of safety actions into reality on the front line for the helicopter industry you know that particularly well obviously feel free to ask questions through the whole event but particularly for that part we're really interested in in the views and the, and the thoughts of, of you as the helicopter community in terms of you know what barriers do you see to implementing all of the different safety initiatives particularly whether it's from IATA or, or other organizations so we'd be really interested to do that and we would like you to do that if you can put your questions in the Q&A function so on the right hand side of the screen you will have a chat and a Q&A if you want to ask me as the host anything specific more logistical problems um, you can drop that in the chat but if you have specific questions you can um, you can put those in the question and answer in the Q&A uh, and then Obviously, we won't be able to necessarily answer them all, but uh, we'll answer as many as we can here. We will be recording this session and then putting it uh, online afterwards uh, on the ASA event webpage for this event and then sharing it also through the different associations through EHA, Heli Offshore, uh, and particularly also through our EASA Together for Safety Rotorcraft community. So, yes, we'll be recording it. We always get that question a lot. Um, and then also, what we'll try and do is, is take as many of the questions and try and answer those as well. And, and we, we're going to create an article around this discussion uh, for our AirOps community as well. So you know, there's lots of kind of ways we'll use this material. And, and, and one of the key things, you know, so many events 
that you, you att we attend, you know, even I attend, that people attend these days are, you know, it's like a one-off event. You, you go to a thing, you have the event, and then you leave. And, and really want, what we want this to be the part of is a continual discussion about safety within the rotorcraft community. And it's something we're, you know, the whole idea of, of the Together for Safety initiative and the collaborative approach that we're taking is around having those kinds of conversations uh, where, you know, it's it's normal to, to have discussions about safety and, and it's accessible and easy. And particularly on the rotorcraft community site, you know, we have where we have the different topics, they're there to provide the, with the ability to, to add comments and ask questions. And similarly, you yeah, the rotorcraft community is a great place. And similarly, Similarly, we also have uh, a LinkedIn group for a group called the ESPNR, the European Safety Promotion Network for Rotorcraft as well. So, you know, we have lots of opportunities in order to engage with the discussion and we really encourage you to do that and, and join with us. So as I say, in, in terms of the subject itself, yeah, we were we were looking for something, you know, what could we pick as a, a, as a good topic for a first sort of webinar strategic webinar about you know how do we how do we implement safety in the rotorcraft community um you know obviously from our side at EASA we have this something called the European plan for aviation safety that has lots of plans and specific safety actions we also have hopefully you've all heard of our rotorcraft roadmap that uh, David's the leader for, where again, we have you know, specific work streams and activities and actions at a collaborative level for the European aviation community. But we have all, yeah, the challenge of course, is we have all of these different actions and all of these different activities going on. And, and you know, the question we've been asking ourselves in the setup of this event is, is whether we're clear about the safety challenges that we face. You know, are we providing you as the industry with with clarity of you know what to do and how to do it and then you know once that information has reached the front line and and you know yourselves in 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 the active helicopter community you know is it then is it easy for you to then put those into practice you know certainly the experience suggests it's not and and it's really useful to have a discussion about what those challenges are and particularly you know we're going to break this discussion into three parts and the first part particularly is then you know how do we take that best practice and those actions to the front line in the first place um, you know, how do we do we set clear enough expectations? You know, do we communicate to industry in the right way? You know, and how do we manage change and manage the activities? And, and, you know, firstly, perhaps if I come to you, Tim, can you, you know, share some thoughts from your side about you know, how we take best practices to the front line? Yes, yeah, certainly, John. I, I think the key to ensuring that best practice gets to the front line is a very deliberate and managed process which turns the recommendations into action. I think experience shows that there's, there's many reasons why best practices and recommendations don't get adopted. I suppose people look at them and ask, is this, is it mandatory? Do I need to take on a recommendation or a best practice? Is it just somebody's good idea? There may of course be a misunderstanding of the recommendation itself. What's it actually setting out to achieve? Perhaps a lack of understanding of the safety benefit. Um, and if there's a perception with a recommendation or an action that is just going to add work to my daily life, combine that with a lack of understanding of the safety benefit, and you've got a real challenge. Um, you know, the question is, why would I do this? Why would I use my time and resource to do this? And there's also, I think, a conflict because most operators who have been around for a while and have got approved systems are already doing what they consider to be a best practice. <laughs> you know, it's recognised by either the regulator or a customer as the right thing to do. It's been approved, so there's potentially a conflict there. And there might also be conflicts between, um, you know, if operators are operating across regions uh, where they've got multiple regulatory requirements, there might be a conflict there. Indeed, certainly in the offshore world, um, there's a potential for conflict with contractual requirements where operators are, are looking to meet uh, the requirements of a number of different customers. So each of those potential blockers has to be addressed, I think, um, to enable the adoption of a recommendation or a best practice, and it needs to be done through a deliberate and planned process. It won't just happen because we want or hope it to. Yeah, and I, th I think that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Is it's, you know, it's the, 
it, it's kind of the balancing of in fact we, we have this discussion a lot in, in some of the safety management uh, uh, groups that we, we have is you know it's this idea of work as imagined work versus work as done and you know you imagine that the reality of a safety initiative or a safety action that you put in place um, actually can be achieved in a certain way but as you say there's the perception of you know is that the right thing and and and, and then you know how do I actually do that and perhaps if I can turn to you Thierry you know Given you know you represent such a diversity of the industry and, and operators of all sorts sorts of different sizes doing lots of different things, you know what do you see as some of the challenges of you know particularly on how we we reach the front line with those best practices and, and actions? Yes, I, on my side, I represent uh, a lot of very small entities that are helicopter operators, and they have to face a very wide uh, regulatory framework to comply with. And in such a situation, there is a natural tendency to feel that if one is compliant, one is safe. If that is not forbidden, it means that it is safe, and so and so. Thus, the best practice concept is quite difficult to promote uh, in this uh, area because uh, it could be regarded as a contribution to the administrative burdens uh, to which the operators need to address. And I would say that it is probably more or less the same for the representatives of the administrations and services that are tasked to assume the surveillance of the industry. In addition, uh, seen from the playing field of the staff of a helicopter operator, the difference is often seen between a, a recommended practice on the regulation. If, for example, a recommended practice is included in the operational manual of an operator as a mean of compliance, this manual is then approved by the authority and the compliance with its contents is now mandatory inside the company. Thus, the recommended practice is now regarded as a rule to comply with by the front line. And uh, they don't make the difference if we input another uh, if we advertise for another uh, uh, best practice, for another recommendation, in that uh, very, very uh, heavy uh, reference to address uh, as in um, in regulatory, uh, uh, in uh, administrative burden, generally speaking, uh, safety concept, uh, as Tim said, uh, the contract with uh, uh, with the, 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 the contractors may have their own uh, uh, obligation to uh, fulfill and uh, it, it might be very, very in hard and it is not easy to be heard by the, by the front line, by the playing field of the operators. Thanks for that, Beauty Aaron. I think what you highlight there is particularly you know, one of the interesting challenges is that, as you say, there's sometimes there's almost I wouldn't say too many actions, but you know it's it's identifying what's the what are the really important things we should be doing, um, and then the differences uh, as Tim talked about between regulation, good practice, you know, and, and and everything kind of in between. And perhaps that's a good time then to, to turn to David. And I know you know we have lots of actions in our Rotorcraft roadmap. You know, and, and from our side, do you think as a regulator, how can we help actions at the front line from our side? Yes, uh, yes, indeed, this is a, a real challenge and that we've noticed that. Um, I think the first uh, probably milestones is uh, to tell a comprehensive story to the people. Uh, trying to explain, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, the, in the EPAS, for instance, you had a big bit and species uh, which were, uh, I would say, targeting rotorcraft community here and there in a document that is uh, 200 pages long and people are getting lost. They don't understand that. And that's why, for instance, we've, we've been through a, a, a new format of the EPAS with some specific rotorcraft aspects where, where, where actually we can gather all together uh, the different actions to give a comprehensive picture of the actions and why they are targeting this and these uh, uh, communities. The second aspect is to find the good relays in the organizations. Uh, because, you know, uh, an authority, whether it is a Euro at the European level or nationals, then, then it's cascaded down the messages uh, within each organization. And to reach the front lines, we, we have to find the right relays, people that um, first understand uh, what are the intent of the actions, 
uh, translate them into their operational framework and specific situation, and then communicate it to their uh, front line in the right manner, in a positive way, not as a burden. Usually, you know, uh, it's often perceived as, as being burdensome. Uh, and it's really uh, highlighting what would be the benefit, the backgrounds, and, and uh, how, how it could change uh, within their, their daily operations. I would say one of the other point is to uh, benchmark themselves. Uh, and, and that's really something the community is not used. Alia Offshore is a good example. Uh, and uh, where with their big data, they, they've started to benchmark some of the operations uh, in an anonymous manner. But then uh, you could realize how different you could be uh, because everybody, you know, in each organization do their process procedure and, and at the end, uh, the outcome of that uh, in the good face and, and uh, thinking they are the best ones. Uh, but sometimes, you know, and especially in small organization, you are blind about what's, what's really uh, the common practices outside. Benchmarking yourself via organizations could really uh, put some light on, on some areas that you were not conscious of. And that's really something uh, which is very interesting. And the last is the feedback loop. You know, uh, from the front field, uh, the feedback loop, okay, this action makes sense, or it does not. And sometimes uh, with the reason why and how we could adapt it, because the people doing are the best place uh, usually to, to really make the difference and, and adapt uh, some recommendations, best practices to their local, uh, I would say, uh, environment in the best way and this flexibility needs to be kept also uh, within within each organization yeah and i think you raised some good points actually some great points came out of that discussion generally and, and i think you know particularly one thing i was thinking about as you, you were saying you were talking there david is the uh, you know is is the word translate and particularly in context of making sure we translate it a into the right operational context first because if yeah we when we were preparing for this we were we were talking particularly also about the importance of reaching people in national local languages but actually it's interesting one of the things when we were setting up the idea of our kind of how we would do safety promotion and the context of Together for Safety and what we're doing with, with the European Safety Promotion Network for Rotorcraft with the ESPNR is, is actually one of the biggest things is speaking in the right language. And as I say, there's the, the, the national language, you know, so people can, can read it, perhaps not necessarily just in English, but it's in the right operational language as well. And using, you know, dare I say, one of the biggest things we're trying to do more of, and I think we can help a lot with that collectively as a community is, you know, kind of, you know, whilst lots of things might be positioned in kind of regulatory speak, for want of a better word, is how you can actually turn that into something that an operator can read, understand, and do something with, because the message, and I think it's about the clarity of message, which is a really interesting one. I think that's quite an important one. And, and interestingly, we, We've got a first uh, a first question that we that that came in um, from Dave Harris, and, and he was asking um, uh, basically with his uh, with it, so within their company, their minimum standards are all traceable to events and findings, uh, and the things that cause them to be adopted in terms of actions and activities. Um, and could EASA provide easier traceability of safety measures in that way beyond formal accident investigation recommendations? And actually, it's interesting, it highlights to me particularly, um, we try and do more of that in, in having the safety issues that we have in the safety risk portfolios that we have that support the European Plan for Aviation Safety that effectively connect exactly the same. It's it's kind of the European level equivalent of, of what uh, what what Dave had in the question there, and I know Tim, you know, from your side, maybe I just come to you because you do quite a lot of that in Heli Offshore, don't you? Where you have your safety strategy and and the different safety topics and the work streams and the actions then clearly flow from that. And I know, you know, we worked quite closely together in the development of, you know, as you were developing that with Heli Offshore with what we put in the European Safety Plan and the Rotorcraft Roadmap. Maybe you can talk a little bit. About linking actions to to safety problems, if that makes sense. Absolutely, John. I, I think it's imperative. Um, otherwise, we all spend all day trying to resolve all safety issues, uh, which, as we know, is impossible. So there's got to be 
a degree of prioritization and it must be based on uh, safety benefit. Uh, there must be a clear understanding if somebody's asked there, and as David was saying, um, let's be really clear about if I adopt this recommendation or practice, the safety benefit will be X. And how does that tie into not just a benefit to the operator, but a benefit to the industry? I think a really important uh, element or extension of that is how do I know that what I just did in fact had the safety benefit or the safety impact uh, that I thought it was going to have? Uh, and therefore, what are we going to measure in the future? But that prioritization of what are the top three things I'm going to put in my targeted safety plan to address this year or over whichever period of time uh, to use up my time and resource. What are those three things? How am I going to prioritize them? Um, and, and what's the safety benefit going to be is, is really clear. But in Heavy Offshore, we've got a safety performance model, which is driven by data. So the data based on accidents uh, currently at the moment, that's the level that we look at. But the data tells us that there are three key areas uh, which cause uh, fatal accidents, CFIT, loss of control and single point failure in mechanical systems. So our activities and our actions uh, within the work streams in Heli Offshore are directly related to uh, improved safety outcomes in those three areas. And when you've got that sort of end to end story that David talked about earlier on, I think that's what um, helps to achieve enrollment to the level necessary to, to really drive action. Yeah, I think that's really good. And perhaps, David, from your side, I know yeah, there are lots of examples, whether it's in the Rotorcraft Roadmap, you know, whether it's MPAs to regulations where we cover that. Perhaps you could say a little bit about that as well. Yes, maybe uh, at least uh, on the uh, actions and the standards. Uh, you know, usually uh, when, when we are updating a rule or creating a new one, there is an NPA. And within that, you have always a section which is referring to the background and, and the reason why uh, it could come from accident, incidents, or, or IKEO, uh, I would say, uh, best practices, uh, uh, SARS. Um, but uh, we, we do not issue uh, any, any updates or new requirements without this. Uh, and by the way, uh, in, in uh, all the time, it's also backed up by uh, what we call the best intervention strategies and, and where you can have the, the figures and, and the real, um, I would say, uh, uh, analysis of the cost benefit uh, associated to, to the update. So that's really uh, a point we, we are trying to be strong. Uh, now that for sure it's, it's at, at the ASA level and then the national authorities. But I would like to say also that uh, to, to rebound on what the team was, was saying, uh, each organization uh, focusing on its own, uh, I would say, uh, operational environment, has the ability to uh, also uh, go beyond and, and uh, analyze further their operation and, as I said, benchmark sometimes. I guess the SMS uh, that will uh, come up soon uh, is, is, could be a key area to, to improve some, uh, some of the practices today and also go beyond uh, pure accident uh, recommendation and, and uh, adapt locally to, to the needs of people. Yeah, and actually, that's a really good point. And, and, and one of the things, in fact, it's interesting that you link there to, uh, to SMS, because one of the things we've been talking about, we have a, another activity look, just generally looking at, you know, how can we simplify and improve SMS effectiveness? And we see there's an awful lot of process around SMS. But one of the things we've been talking a lot about is to always, whatever it is your, is being done in terms of a safety action, is to link that to then the ultimate statement of how is that activity reducing aviation risks by engaging sorry how how does how does that how does that reduce risks by t in in order to manage operational safety so we keep our risk to the to an acceptable level and and it's knowing almost like how much is enough safety and what you talked about there in in terms of the traceability of that you know, it, i realize you know even from some of the questions it's always it's always great to understand that regardless of how good a job we might think we do at communicating from our side as the ASA about um, you know the e pass and where the actions come from and things like that actually it's you know it's something perhaps I i've taken away here as an action already for us to kind of promote more about the connection between where the actions come from 
uh, and uh, you know, in terms of not just accidents, but the wider analysis, as you say, the best intervention strategies, um, you know, that go by, sit behind the NAA, uh, the MPAs, and then also the Rotopraf roadmap. And perhaps um, we've got another question that um, that perhaps I could put to Thierry, uh, which is kind of an interesting one, particularly from your side, as uh, from the you know, with so many particularly small operators, is. Um, Carl has asked you know, who decides what is considered good practice and and I guess that's the biggest challenge for small operators is if there's a hundred pieces of good practice how do they decide which is which of those hundred pieces of good practice is the right ones for them if that makes sense yeah so in fact uh, you we must uh, catch that uh, uh, I would tell theoretical uh, SMS good practice mm -hmm. regulation is seen in some companies operating for years in remote area with the, only two or three helicopters, sometimes just one with two pilots. Uh, you know, in our industry, the vertical flight, uh, two thirds of the daily business is very local flight performed by very by small prof small professional entities, and it is uh, beyond their comprehension to work really uh, on a daily basis on all of that. Uh, for them, the best practice is only what their uh, long lasting experience has uh, learned to them. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in those, those small companies, the accrues seldom feel unsafe uh, by their uh, very soci sociological temperament. They are enthusiasts for their daily job and feel naturally optimistic. So they would not probably probably not feel easy with the flight, which is a demanding occupation, uh, if not. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are not not cautious, but they have a cultural way to manage their own safety. Uh, we could summarize that by the sentence. We always have done this like that, and we are still there to speak about it. So uh, let us, your uh, best practice, uh, uh, SMS, even the SMS is, is uh, hard to, uh, to make working, uh, except ju just to uh, comply with the rule, uh, to make something consistent and something useful for safety in the very small company. Thanks for that. And I think that's a, a really good opportunity perhaps to move on to kind of the subject slightly and particularly looking at, you know, we, we've talked particularly about actions and best practice, but then the you know, once it comes to the turning that into action at the front line in organizations, you know, perhaps Thierry, if I could kind of come back to you at the next steps, what do you what do you see as some of the biggest challenges? for the organizations you work with in, in actually implementing things at the front line in, in, in that context? What kind of challenges do you see? Okay, uh, the, the problem, uh, the daily problems that I have to face is a problem of language with, with my members, with the members, the population I have described previously. You know, you, you must, uh, know that uh, those pilots do not have to address international procedures on a daily basis. They are even seldom in contact with ATC for their daily job. So they have not a lot of occasion to improve their international communication proficiency. They have uh, not a lot of occasion to improve their English. Uh, so in, in such a in such a population, promoting best practices is more or less like uh, advertising for an optional refinement amongst uh, a lot of other requests that are mandatory for a wide part. Then the related communication must be attractive, I would say even seductive. So to reach people in their own language need to be regarded as a prerequisite. Yeah, I think, and I think that is a really good point in terms of yeah the the means of the communication, and I think you know certainly in terms of what I've taken out of the discussion so far is that you know it's it's about you know people understanding the source and the reason for whatever actions and recommendations we're talking about. It's then about being clear 
what the action is. Um, there's then the challenge of how do you prioritize between 100 pieces of best practice potentially and over kind of inflate things for effect at this con in this stage. And then it's the when we're passing that information to the, the people, it's the manner in which we do it, both in terms of language generally and are we talking regulator speak or are we talking common sense? Um, and then that's a big thing where you know, the more we can translate complicated regulatory things that might be very, very big into uh, a, a more common sense approach. And, and it's interesting you know, from our side, you know, we've been learning a lot about kind of the marketing approach and traditionally in aviation, you know, in marketing that people talk about a marketing funnel and you have certain kind of detailed things at the bottom and, and less kind of slightly more digestible things at the top. And I think certainly that's something we've learned a lot from there. Uh, and, and maybe if I could turn to you, David, now in terms of, you know, turning recommendations into action, you know, we've got lots of really you know, certainly from our side, you know, there's lots of analysis that goes on uh, in order to address the top risks, you know, the analysis to identify the risks at a collaborative way, you know, the work in the Rotorcraft roadmap, you know, some great uh, initiatives, you know, particularly in terms of like, last year, we had a huge focus on the safety benefits benefits of technology. There's a whole work stream, you know, that's led to things like the, the, the latest uh, virtual reality uh, VR motion simulator approval in the last week or so. You know, maybe you can say a little bit about that side and the turning recommendations and ideas into action as your street sort of spearheading that work. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, as you correctly mentioned, so for instance, the Rotorcraft safety roadmap has been built about principle and then uh, broken down into actions. And obviously, uh, the main challenge is the implementation. Uh, and and uh, so we, we are at the beginning of the road, for instance, but you've mentioned a couple of them. Uh, first, uh, indeed, we have qualified the first virtual reality simulator um, last week uh, to uh, really, uh, um, I would say, reinvent the training, especially on light uh, rotor craft. And I'm sure it's going to be a, a, a game changer. Uh, what it requires, I can tell you, it's a lot of energy, resilience, and being stubborn from time to time to convince people that it's going in the right direction. But then uh, what uh, you can notice, and that's something that is down to the feedback loop, uh, is that when you have a success like that, it has a, you know, a, a snowball effect. And, and then people start to realize that yes, first we can change. Secondly, sometimes for the better, simpler, more efficient, and at a lower cost. Because I can tell you a virtual reality simulator, as it is today compared to a full flight simulator, we have an order of magnitude of, of more than uh, 10 to 15 in terms of cost. And, and uh, uh, that's really uh, then this ball effect that you have to uh, really, uh, I would say, capitalize on uh, to bring all the, the goodwill and, and people uh, around, uh, around you. Uh, but indeed, the first steps, Breaking, breaking the ice, I would say, or breaking the habits is, is always the most difficult. Uh, and definitely, uh, and it's valid for uh, all kinds of organizations, from big to small, it's even more challenging for big. Um, changing the habits, changing the way of thinking uh, is definitely the biggest uh, challenge. But once you've done it, you demonstrated it on a you know, some couple of uh, very targeted examples, then people start to realize that yes, it works and you can change, we can change all. And at the end of the day, the benefits are coming. That's what we've seen on the virtual reality simulator. And typically now uh, we see that uh, it's uh, start to boom around and even, you know, the, the ops uh, environment uh, and, and the FCL, uh, which is quite traditional uh, way of thinking and approaching the, the crediting, the training and stuff like that do see now the full benefit of it. And I'm sure we, we could see some, some real change in the future. And if it's valid for the, uh, some specific, it is valid for all kinds of action, definitely. And, and that's really, uh, within organization, you have to be resilient, sometimes uh, convince, come again, back and back and back, up to the result is shown, then communicate on the results because it's going to be the game changer at the end of the day. Thanks, David. I think you, you, you know, there were some really good points. If I maybe pick a couple out, is one of the things you used the word at the end, the the, 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 the communication part. And I think you know this example of, of this webinar hopefully is a great you know, a great example of you know having this collaborative approach 
to our communication as well. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, the situation if you've got so much information that you know it's hard to know what to do with, and then particularly you then get the challenge of well, how do you how do you know what's the most important things? How do you demonstrate, as you talked about there, David, with the virtual reality uh, simulators, is you know by having a targeted project with a clear benefit and a positive outcome that you can communicate well and i think this is something you know we're particularly trying to do through a you know through our collaborative efforts i think and you know it's a great example where in the past so the the, the, the context i've been using is quite often safety in aviation is like being in a room with a hundred people all having a hundred different conversations and we're all having very very well-meaning discussions about all of the different great things we're all doing and the more we can kind of combine those conversations into the most important things at the same time and certainly we yeah you know, we've been doing a lot more of that at a communication level particularly you know we, with EHA with Heli Offshore and with other organizations so you know when we write about something you know then I know, you know Isabella and, and, and Peter and Thierry and, and the others and the team behind EHA then take the things that we've done and make that specific to their members and that community and i know particularly tim with you and, and your team at heli offshore we do the same thing where you know when we work on things together we try and communicate that together and, and kind of push you know as, as, as david said i think it's really good is, is push of it, pushing promoting here's a clear thing we did that had a clear benefit and this is the reason why you should do that and, and perhaps you know i know there are so many great projects here. I've been at a number of your conferences now and seen the enthusiasm of your members around the different work streams and projects. And perhaps you can you can talk a little bit about how you've kind of turned recommendation into action at the front line uh, within Heli Offshore. Yes, yeah, certainly, John. And uh, before I do that, I'd just like to uh, sympathise totally with with Thierry and his issue around language. I think, of course, there's that language when. Um, that language issue, you know, across multiple nationalities. But I think safety itself creates a challenge, even for those for whom English is their first language. You know, rec what does recommendation mean? Is it um, is it mandatory? Um, in some environments, a recommendation should be taken on unless there's a reason not to do so. In others, um, people might uh, assume that a recommendation is to some degree optional. You know, is best practice is that really the distillation of lots of different operators practices uh, with the best pulled out uh, to create a best practice or is it just a good idea from one or two groups so we we have to be clear on that um, the use of that language i think but um coming back to your point about how heli offshore's um, attacked this well heli offshore as you know has created a number of recommended practices which genuinely are the distillation of uh, best operating practices from uh, member organizations and beyond uh, and they've uh, created documentation and then published them and I think to start off with hoped that they would be um, implemented and we realized that actually we need that very deliberate process to go through to ensure that uh, the, the risk of anybody opting out uh, of, uh, of implementing is reduced to a minimum. So we've created a tool and it's based on a very um, basic process loop, but it addresses, I think, most of the key issues that have been raised so far. The first stage is, is access. It's connecting the potential adopters of any recommended practice with the people who wrote it. You've just talked about the need to communicate and understand what it, what's the intent of this uh, recommendation? What's, what's going to benefit everybody? Why did we write this this way? And I think the conversation is really important because it doesn't always uh, lift off the written page in the way that the writer intended every time. The second stage is um, then allowing an operator to go through an evaluative process and say, where am I? What are my current practices versus this new recommended practice? And if that requires an operator creating a gap analysis tool, there's, there's new work we've just given to them. So we've created the gap analysis tool for them um, around the particular recommended practice. And as you said earlier on, if you can reduce 10, 20, 30 pages into a list of very specific actions or requirements, and people know that they're answering now, am I aligned? Am I not aligned? Will I choose to align in the future? That's a really important process. Um, and we can save people time and energy going through, uh, going through that exercise. 
but also it allows us to collect data so we can see where is the industry at uh, in terms of alignment. Um, and David, I think, talked about benchmarking in his introduction. If through the use of this tool, individual operators can benchmark themselves in terms of alignment with the rest of industry, it's all de-identified, but at least they can see, and that maybe helps shift the idea of, um, no, I don't need to adopt to, well, hang on, I may, we may be, uh, we may be odd, odd ones out here. There's an important stage around um, partnering with the um, individual adopter, and that's by providing materials for their own internal use. So we're able to provide materials for promotion communication inside an organization. So whilst it's based on heli offshore material, it's adopted by that uh, organization as their own. And, and then we come to the industry feedback piece, and that's in two sessions. I've talked about the ability to benchmark to see what the whole industry picture is in terms of adoption levels, adoption plans. There's a really important piece in there. Operators uh, or adopters need to be able to push back against some recommendations. They need to be able to say, no, this recommendation isn't fit for purpose. It doesn't work for me in my circumstance. Uh, and that's really important feedback. That's the subject of a really important conversation between the person who wrote the the recommendation uh, and the community it's, it's designed to serve. And then lastly, we're looking at collecting data um, over the longer term, looking at performance indicators. If we set out to adopt these recommended practices across the industry, what do we expect to see change in terms of safety performance? Uh, and if we start measuring those things now, hopefully whilst there is a delayed reaction, we will be able to see over the course of time um, and potentially make that very difficult causal link between action to adopt and an improvement in safety performance. We'll never know 100% because there's so many moving parts. But it's only through this very deliberate process that we believe um, we're going to get the best out of implementing better recommended practice. Yeah, and I think, interestingly, you hit a number of really good points that have come up in some of the comments and questions. So, you know, Is Isabella from uh, the European Helicopter Association can pointed out also you know you were talking about data and and the challenges of collecting data and you know how that drives safety improvements and she was high, you know, highlighting also you know in addition to the work you're doing at Heli Offshore, you know, the work that we've been doing within the Rotorcraft Roadmap, particularly, and that supports the European Plan for Aviation Safety in terms of analysis, but then also EHA helping to try and you know, harmonise the collection of data as much as we can at a European level. And, and we talked a little bit in the preparation of this about you know, the, some of the challenges where you know, the, the, the ideal of what we think happens at European level when that's diluted down at national level is, is quite a different thing sometimes. And, and, and there's a lot of effort collectively going into to supporting that where we identify those needs. And actually, it's interesting that uh, Alexander from uh, Airbus Helicopters that we work very closely with on safety promotion activities pointed out and reminded actually also that you know, we've talked a lot about collaboration with industry, but actually it's used to, important to highlight particularly also the collaboration that happens with the national authorities to support the industry. And you know, we have now as part of the uh, so Rotorcraft Committee, which is, is one of the is kind of the key advisory body for the Rotorcraft community. Yeah, you know, we have sessions with the NAAs as part of that as well. Um, and similarly, within our safety promotion activity and communication, um, we have a group that, that my team run called the Safety Promotion Network, where we work with the national authorities specifically, uh, and, and that helps to coordinate. And perhaps before we move on then to, to the next part is there's there's um, uh, a comment or question that Ariana uh, had, and, and actually, Tim, maybe if I could come to you on this, because I know, so she asked, she says, she realizes there are many differences and she talks about she asked have we benchmarked other industries to address other opportunities and things we learn and i know you know tim from your side particularly because you're engaged a lot with oil and gas companies particularly and also offshore renewables etc you know you do quite a lot of benchmarking already maybe you can mention a bit about some of the just yeah you know, the, the the benchmarking and, and other links you've looked at with other industries perhaps briefly Yes, yeah, certainly so, John. So, um, yes, in offshore oil and gas, there's a huge client community um, who, who are being served by the operators, each of whom have their um, um, insights and thoughts and contractual requirements around best practice. Uh, and that comes back to this potential for conflict now and potential for complexity. 
because um, one operator may be serving any number of clients, may be serving one or more regulators. So it's very difficult to be able to distill down to a, a common uh, operating practice that meets the intent for everybody, um, uh, meets the regulatory intent and meets the, uh, the client's intent. So the really important piece there is to understand when somebody, when somebody is asking for a very specific requirement or practice, is it outcome based? Or is it, uh, is it very specific to a particular piece of equipment, a particular course of action? We need to be much clearer and simplify what the requirements are so that an operator can turn around, have a conversation with either the regulator or the client and turn around and say, yep, I get the intent of what you're after with this requirement. This is how we meet the same intent through our standard operating practices. This is how we address that. And that conversation is really important because now it talks about alignment through the intended outcome as opposed to alignment just through a strict compliance process. Yeah, I think that, that's really well put actually, Tim. And, and I think that's such an important point is, is that, you know, how, how does that conversation take place to really make that happen and make it happen easily? I, you know, I know I've heard some, you know, I've been cornered at the odd conference occasionally where people have said, well, we tried to do this great thing. And then, you know, just that conversation when we went to the authority or we talked to the customer was completely different to the way we thought it would. Um, and maybe Thierry, if I could kind of come to you with a follow up question to that is, do you see that? And, and if we start thinking now about the challenges that we see um with implementation is is what are the key challenges once you know you see particularly with operators particularly the small operators in actually doing things you know do it have it making safety improvements is it something is it a challenge that there's too many things and it's hard to know which are the most important to do yeah you know, what what do you see as their biggest challenges as particularly the small operators as far as the small operators uh, we must uh, point, highlight that at least half of the operations are under SPO, special operation, that need uh, to address tailored uh, safety implementations. Uh, in that, uh, it, it means that uh, what is done by one operator is not exactly the same what that uh, will be done uh, for another one, for another task with another customer. Sometimes the best practices that uh, we promote may seem inconsistent with the customer's requirements, it, mainly because they have to, uh, to face other regulations than the aviation one, for example. And uh, we use recommendations to help our operators uh, to address uh, their special operation uh, requirement. And it is not always easy to see uh, from outside uh, what is uh, a regulation, something you need to, what is mandatory, what is a guidance to help the operator uh, to do their job, what is a method of compliance, what is recommendatory, and sometimes uh, one change to the other, because, uh, for example, a national administration that has to qualify uh, um, uh, a safety uh, concern, uh, say, uh, I will use this recommendation as something you must comply with. And uh, in, in some occasion, uh, the customer says, I oh, know it's not possible because in on my view, we must comply with the safety requirements, for example, of uh, the uh, civilian worker for power lines uh, or for the firemen or things like that. Besides that, uh, with regard to the working law uh, that could impose nationally other rules that, that have been negotiated with the union that are different from the aerial one, uh, we, may, we may have uh, some inconsistency between what we are promoting on a daily basis uh, as an association that uh, work on uh, air safety and uh, what is the perception of the problem from the manager of a company because they, we, we are working only on one way the air safety the european regulatory uh, framework for aviation the easa but it is not the case for our members 
And, and, and actually, it's really interesting that I actually I had a separate conversation with uh, somebody and an operator in, in in one country in Europe where they I think particularly this is a problem for the helicopter community where you know particularly in 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 this example was particularly in Hems where there was one element where well is it is it under national rules as a state flight equivalent or is this under EASA rules and you know you can kind of flip a coin and there's something that well I could do this in this way or actually there's then dare I say in this case there was discussion of well is there pressure to meet the contract to the state under state flight rules that makes something possible that might not be and I know you know as a community the helicopter the rotorcraft community kind of faces that challenge probably in aviation more than anybody else and I think you know that's an interesting one for us to take away and, and kind of think about also in terms of the challenge and perhaps David if I can come to you now and, and you know similar question is what barriers you see for the industry in implementing safety improvements and best practice and particularly from our side from EASA you know how can we support the the industry in, in that implementation. I know there's lots of things already going on in that area. Yes, and, and uh, one point was, was to tackle one of the main comments, uh, too many uh, regulations or, or I would say uh, too many burdensome uh, regulations. Uh, so that's why in the frame of the Rotorcraft Safety Roadmap, you know, we've launched an activity uh, about simplification of, of uh, regulations and, and trying to uh, identify together with the community and the operators. And we've launched a survey for that. Uh, typically, which uh, requirement they consider with no safety, I would say, uh, uh, added value or, or with uh, too high administrative burden. So that's the first uh, aspect. The second one is also uh, addressing one of the points, and it's the link between operator and national authorities. And you know, uh, having uh, what we see very often is a conflictual link or relationship. Uh, while uh, we, we would definitely promote a, a more uh, partnership uh, relationship because we are all uh, you know in the same boat. Hein? Whether you are a regulator or an operator, at the end of the day. Uh, we want the business to grow for everybody. Huh? Uh, it's the whole community plus uh, the safety associated to that. And this uh, barrier, we try to alleviate it by better communicating with the national authorities. By now, bringing the national authorities and the operator at the same table uh, within the uh, advisory bodies of, of IASA, uh, so that uh, we have a mutual understanding and we avoid local or very local uh, interpretations or, or uh, um, over interpretation sometimes of the rules and the different guidance materials. Uh, and lastly, uh, we are trying to build, and, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll do that by the end of the year, uh, a kind of uh, helicopter rule book so that uh, operators uh, will not have to chase uh, the regulation in the ops, FCL, uh, or, or uh, other kind of uh, regulations. But they will have, uh, you know, a book where uh, you are not mixed with all other regulations. It's the one that are targeted to uh, helicopter. And then, you know, based on that, we could, we could uh, have the associated guidance material. And, you know, uh, we are also very much ready uh, in some instances to, to have uh, discussions with NAAs to, to ease when you have an operator is, is experiencing a blocking point. And we had that in the past with a cross-border operation, for instance, and, and typically where, where for uh, the, the dangerous operations uh, category, uh, it was different criteria among uh, different countries, uh, neighboring countries, and so sometimes it was difficult to cross the border or you had to change your your setup uh, while uh, you know it should be dangerous the same way for everybody uh, I would say so that's that's uh, where we can see uh, and and help uh, I would say dialogue also um, uh, is a key part uh, and also uh, from my side you know and I'm pushing my my teams uh, and and uh, we, we are trying to to uh, uh, put them in context, more context. Uh, well, obviously, with the COVID uh, crisis, it's more difficult, but uh, sending our people into real operation environment so that they can really feel what is the, 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 the reality of the field 
and, and then uh, you know absorb that because sometimes you know most of our people are coming from that uh, field but but uh, things are changing over the years huh? uh, the environment the economics the relationship with the customer with the national authorities and and for instance we had with the dhc uh, an exchange where, where uh, we were able to, to send some of the people um, doing some some uh, uh, day operations to grab what does it mean on a daily basis? Uh, what is the usual day at the front line? Uh, and have a direct discussion with the people, you know, not filtered by, uh, because what we have by, by, by uh, some bodies which are uh, higher up in the hierarchy, uh, because we have to say, uh, the people that are in the advisory bodies uh, within IASA are uh, more managers than front line. And you have a distortion of the reality already at this, at this level. So uh, it's bringing this, uh, I would say, bridging this gap. Uh, and we hope to, uh, once the COVID uh, is over, do, for instance, some uh, uh, host operations uh, with, with the people, with our people, so that they understand what does it mean wh when you are operating. And, and this mutual understanding, and we could also, under, uh, you know, make the, the uh, other side of the fence. Uh, first, show a more human, uh, you know, authorities. Hein? I think we are all human, and sometimes we 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 have the feeling discussing with people that uh, we are far away and and kind of uh, evil it aware. No, uh, we we want to have the dialogue and and have this uh, really uh, engage, uh, and also express also sometimes directly to the front line uh, what we are doing, why we are doing, and and the message is also not filtered, you know, in that way, uh, because the filters are the two cents. Hein? Uh, you have always, and that's at the end of the day the best way to move together uh, towards a, a mutual understanding and a mutual set of actions, commonly agreed, because that's very important, and, and uh, commonly prioritized. That's what we've done uh, with the Rotorcraft Safety Roadmap, and, and you know, on the streams, we, we see the community uh, that are uh, fully engaged, is fully engaged, uh, even though it's ambitious, but sometimes the ambition uh, is, is actually gathering people around the goal. That's really what I uh, wanted to say. Uh, and that, 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 you, you highlight some so many fantastic points there, David. And, and you know, the, the idea of the commonly agreed, commonly prioritised. I think you know I've written that down and started and highlighted it as one of the kind of big takeaways here. And I think also what you were talking about there is the the closing the gap between the regulator and and, and the front line and and making that conversation more dynamic and more real. And you know, Tim, I remember when we first started having our analysis meetings with the offshore community and inviting everybody to Cologne and and that worked but actually the real breakthrough started to come when we started holding them in holding them in Aberdeen and and actually having the discussion you know in the offices of CHC or Bristos or Babcock or whoever then uh, and, and actually getting the front line you know closing that gap and I think that you know that really made a difference and perhaps you know as we head towards the the kind of final stage of this Tim maybe you know I can, can kind of turn to you and your thoughts on what do you see as the challenges of implementation at the front line and and how can we address those? I think uh, just to pick up on that frontline communication point, hugely important. At the end of the day, you know, whether we're a regulator, whether we're an association, uh, whether we're an organization, our job is to serve the frontline and make sure they can do their job to the best of their ability. So understanding what it means to them to be able to do the job uh, and be able to take that away uh, and, and, and distill that into any recommendation or best practices is hugely significant, very, very important. If we can achieve that, we'll have taken a major, major step. I think in summary, um, John, it's really um, back to a number of points that have been discussed. Open, clear communication. Let's get that connection right. What is it that we're trying to do? Why are we trying to do it? What are the safety benefits? Um, what is meant by this recommendation? Let's have a conversation between those who are gonna use it, those who want it applied to make sure that it's as, as sound as it can be before it gets adopted. Um, understand that safety case. Let's try and simplify the adoption process. So wherever we can, let's just make sure that's as straightforward as possible. We're not adding work uh, to an already burdened frontline um, or organizations. And then um, let's do what we can to collect the data around uh, adoption levels. So we've got a good picture as an industry. Where are we at? We've come up with this great idea. We think it's going to make a safety benefit. Just how, how far has it been adopted? If it hasn't at all, then why would we expect um, there to be any difference in our safety performance? Yet if we're targeting agreed, as you say, commonly agreed priorities, 
uh, and we can bring everybody along and we can then make that link between the adoption and hopefully somewhere down the road an improvement of safety performance. I think that cycle, that loop, uh, is a really important process to uh, try and establish for all of us. Fantastic, Tim, and, and a huge thanks to uh, to all of you. We're kind of reaching the final, uh, the, the end of the session now. Um, maybe just a final point. I think we answered most of the questions. There were some that we didn't quite get to. Um, I was just going to make two last points based on the questions. So somebody asked about, you know, the message is great to, from the commercial side, but how does that apply to general aviation and, and other activities, you know, helicopters or otherwise? And actually, interestingly, last week we had our IASA general aviation season opener session that did exactly that. And actually we know some national authorities and associations have been doing that at national level and we're trying to encourage more of that. And again, it's about closing that, you know, it comes back to what we were talking about there, closing the, the, the gap between, you know, the regulatory community and the front line of operations and bringing those together. And then there are also some comments about uh, the VR virtual reality simulator and using that. And one of the things we're looking at for future safety promotion is to do sort of scenario based kind of promotional activity, which will hopefully help. And I think that comes back to some of the points that uh, that's been talked about in the session in terms of, you know, being practical with the solution and being able to demonstrate the benefits and the success really easily. So, yeah, I think on that note, you know, huge thanks to uh, our panelists. Uh, thanks to you as an audience. Um, we'll post this, as I say, in, in the events page and the, the community site. And obviously, EHA and the uh, Ailey Offshore and the other organisations will have the recording as well. So, um, for me, huge thanks to uh, our panellists and thanks to you uh, as our audience. So, we'll close the session there. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good uh, day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.